this next segment, we have actually set aside some time to answer some questions that were posed by some of you during the registration process. We actually had quite a lot of questions, but in view of time, and we want to make sure that the people here actually have the chance to answer their questions live, we have shortlisted just two questions that we will post uh, Dr. to Dr. Eileen and Dr. U, uh, Eugene. So for the first question here, what are the symptoms to identify colorectal cancer? Is constipation one of it? To Dr. Eileen. Hi. Um, so I think I've actually covered, you know, some of these symptoms that help to identify colorectal uh, cancer in one of my earlier slides. I, uh, what I think needs to be emphasized that it's usually a change in the bowel habit that we're talking about, a change that is persistent uh, and recent that we're more concerned about. So in terms of constipation, if it's of a recent onset, it's different from your usual bowel habit, um, or perhaps it's associated with other symptoms. For example, if you have difficulty even passing gas, um, or you have abdominal distension, bloating, you can't eat, you have vomiting, then this will be some, uh, something that's worrying. This uh, versus perhaps constipation that's been ongoing for many years and perhaps slowly getting worse. We still do need or recommend that uh, some form of colonic screening or investigation is done for that long-standing constipation. But in terms of which is more suggestive for cancer, then I think something that's more recent. I hope that helps to answer the question. Yeah, I think that was a very good summary and explanation, elaboration as well from the slides. Okay, so moving on to the next question. So is it still advisable for an 89-year-old diagnosed with colorectal cancer to undergo either surgery or chemotherapy? This is for Dr. Eugene. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, this is a rather complex question, um, and I would just want to show one slide um, to give everyone an idea of why it's complex. Um, and the reason is this. 89-year-olds can be in very varying levels of health, and um, their baseline condition can differ very, differ, very widely. So really, the, 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 you can see on the left is a healthy aged gentleman, and on the right is a patient who is bed-bound and he's being fed by a tube, and he's probably not able to move around by himself and has to be cared by his caregivers. So I guess the question is, well, it depends. Um, and it depends on what kind of care the patient wants, if he's able to make a decision, and what our aims of treatment are. I mean, in the end, the doctor is there to provide the treatment, but it's very important for the patient and family to understand what their aims of treatment are and um, go along with that. So for example, in a healthy 89 year old who is keen and is very well, and he wants to carry on with a good quality of life and he already still has a good quality of life and his risk of surgery is not particularly high. He may elect to go ahead for um, surgery or chemotherapy for, for that matter. Although chemotherapy generally is not given in patients that old, but surgery certainly is a consideration. But of course in the patient on the right who has very poor quality of life, so to speak, perhaps it may not be worth going through that kind of treatment. So it really depends on the patient profile and what the patient and family wants. And the doctors are there to provide input. But in the end, I think the patient and family is the one who should decide. Very good answer. I really, really liked it. Okay, so that's all for our pre collated questions. So now let's start with the first question. Maybe I'll post this to Dr. Eileen. What is the ideal age to start colonoscopy or endoscopy monitoring? I believe you answered those questions, but maybe just a re-emphasis for everyone here. Okay, sure, no problem. So I think uh, the, the correct term for an endoscopy or what most people understand an endoscopy to be uh, seems to be a gastroscopy, which is an evaluation of the stomach. Now, there's actually no recommendation or screening guideline for things like stomach cancer because it's something that is not so common in Singapore um, or even in the other developed countries. So essentially only when you have symptoms, so for example, bloating, gastric discomfort, gastric pain, then we will suggest doing a gastroscopy. Now, when it comes to a colonoscopy, I think we mentioned earlier, if you don't have any symptoms, uh, you're pretty well, the recommended age at this point in time, according to the Singapore guidelines, is 50. But 
this is probably the age at which cancer starts. So if we are talking about trying to pick up um, polyps and to prevent cancer, then we should start earlier. And as Eugene alluded to, individually, you know, each one of us may decide that we want to do it earlier. So from the age of perhaps 45 or even younger. Um, and how do we decide whether it should be done younger or not? And this, especially I'm talking about patients with a family history of cancer. So if let's say you've got a first degree relative in the family who got colorectal cancer at the age of 50, then you shouldn't wait until you're 50. Shouldn't, it shouldn't be 45 as well. So in general, the rule or the guideline is that you start your screening 10 years earlier. So you would want to start your doing colonoscopies or doing a check at 40 instead of 45. Yeah, so ideal age really depends on whether you have symptoms, whether you have family history um, of uh, colon cancer. Yeah. Nice. It's a very good combination of everything that we have learned so far in this uh, past 45 minutes. So next question, Dr. Dr. Eugene. So an elderly patient who has, has a tumour on her colon, is it true that MRI scan is needed to ensure that the cancer has not spread to any other organs, especially the lungs? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I'm assuming that um, the patient has a tumour that was just diagnosed uh, on a colonoscopy. So generally what we do is uh, before we recommend any form of treatment to the patients, uh, after we diagnose that there is a cancer in the colon, we need to do what we call staging. And staging is essentially assessment of not only the colon uh, and the tumor itself, but whether the other organs are involved. Because we know as part of the natural history of colon cancer or any cancers is that it will spread over time. And so because when we diagnose the cancer, we really don't know how long it's been in there and how, whether it's spread to other organs or not. So we don't generally do MRI scans unless there's specific indications. Most of the time we do what we call a CT scan, uh, which looks at both the lungs, uh, the liver, as well as the entire chest, abdomen and pelvis. The most common sites of spread is actually the lungs and the liver. Um, so we will do a scan. The scan is called a CT scan in general. Um, some people do a PET scan, but most people will do just a CT scan, which is sufficient to ensure that the cancer is not spread. And depending on the stage of cancer, which is how much the cancer has spread, we can recommend treatment accordingly, whether it's surgery first or chemotherapy first or even radiotherapy. Nice. Good to hear that there will be staging done, actually, and that is actually a part of the process. So I think that answers Zoraida's question well. Okay, next question to Dr. Eileen. I just had my colonoscopy done earlier this year and surgeon removed two polyps. Doctor sent it for biopsy and found it to be benign. Is the incidence of polyps recurrence high? Okay, uh, very good question. Um, I think the tendency really is that if you are already found to have polyps, then the understanding is that the recurrence risk is going to be much higher. Um, one question that, uh, that we often get is how often should I do a scope then if uh, I find polyps on my scope? Um, and the question really depends on the type of polyps that's found, the number of polyps, the size of the polyps. And again, this will determine whether the risk of recurrence is high. We also want to know whether the polyp has been completely removed the first time round. Um, and so I think all of this will determine whether the polyp coming back or the chance of the polyp coming back is going to be high or not. Nice answer. Thank you so much. Let's go on to the next question. Any long-term medicine I need to stop taking before my colonoscopy? I'm 53 years old and I'm on amlodipine and Lipitor. That is for Dr. Eugene. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, essentially, um, what we want to ensure that uh, when you do a colonoscopy, that the colonoscopy is safe. Um, so majority of the time, most medications can be continued during a colonoscopy. Only certain medications that may render the colonoscopy not so safe. For example, blood thinning medications like aspirin or warfarin. Um, because if we do a colonoscopy and we do see polyps and we want to remove them, there's a higher chance of bleeding. So if there are any blood thinning medications that the patient is on, 
um, then they would cause uh, potentially a higher risk of bleeding after the scope, even though during the scope, we may not see any bleeding. So that is one of the common medicines that we stop. Um, other medications that we may want to stop or that we don't want to do um, a scope when the patient is on, for example, chemotherapy, because uh, if patients are on chemotherapy, they may be immunocompromised and they may not be able to tolerate any potential side effects or complications of the colonoscopy. So those are generally the two types of medications we want. Of course, there are many different exceptions, but uh, in general, I would say that is probably uh, what we would look out for. So to your answer on amlodipine and Lipitor, one is for blood pressure and one is for cholesterol. Um, most of the time, we don't need to stop either of the medications to continue your colonoscopy. Very good. Thanks for the great answer. I think most importantly here is also to make sure that all the attendees or audience here actually seek their doctor's advice on your own personalized recommendations on the medications that you are supposed to stop or withhold and also for what duration. All right, Look, uh, moving on to the next question. Um, is it okay to do a screening scope at 36? I think again, this depends on uh, whether you have any family history. Um, you would also want to look at whether you have actually any symptoms. So if you have symptoms, I think, um, for, for instance, if you have been bleeding every day when you open your bowels for the last few months, then even if you're 30, I think you should be going for a colonoscopy to check, okay? Um, and not any of the stool tests that we were talking about earlier, because that's something that um, picks up blood that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Um, so is it possible? Can you do a colonoscopy? I think the long and short, or maybe just to answer this question very briefly, is that yes, you can do it. It is allowed. Um, and sometimes I, I, I tell patients that it's equally important to treat the mind as the body. Um, and there will be some patients who will be very, very anxious um, and they can't sleep well because of all sorts of fears and concern. Uh, but as well, uh, as long as they can understand that each procedure that is done um, carries along with it uh, its own risk, of, even though it's small, uh, but as long as they understand, then I think this is something that is uh, certainly feasible and doable. Great answer. I think that it's very good to actually uh, talk about the the reassurance or the peace of mind alongside the risk. And I think it's a, it's a, here is a like balancing the risk versus benefits here. La. Okay, uh, I think we shall go on to the last question from Dorothy. So uh, thank you, Dr. Eileen. Maybe this for Dr. Eileen, but I think she was in it was in reference to your earlier answers, actually. So it uh, means that there is no scope for small intestines. How do people screen small intestines? Because technically, there might be polyps there. Is, there. is it by a CT or MRI? Maybe for Dr. Eileen to answer, then if Dr. Eugene has anything to add on, you can do so. Okay. So I, I think um, the commonest areas within the gastrointestinal tract where problems can happen uh, are the colon and the stomach. So it's quite rare for the small intestines to have any issues. Now, there are scopes that are specifically for the small intestines, uh, but this is not commonly done um, and only done if patients perhaps present with things like bleeding and we need to find out where the bleeding is from. And we've already checked the stomach and the large intestines and there's no issues and no problems. That's when we may perhaps decide to investigate the small intestines. Uh, perhaps another example uh, of when we will evaluate the small intestines is when patients um, have inflammatory bowel disease that may potentially affect the small intestines. Then we may do things like an MRI uh, of the small intestines, what we call an MRI enterography, to look at whether there is any infection, any tumors within the small intestines. So, um, Generally, there is no scope that is usually or routinely done for the small intestines because it's not a common area to have any issues. Uh, so we don't do screening for small intestines. It's only when there is a medical, pre-existing medical problem that may predispose uh, problems in the small intestines or when they are symptomatic, for example, bleeding. Anything from Dr. Eugene? Or was that really yeah, I mean, answer? just to address the second part about CT and MRI, there are certain CT scan sequences and MRI to look at the small intestine. But again, these are not commonly done. As Eileen has said, um, the risk of 
issues or problems or cancer or polyps developing from the small intestine is actually extremely, extremely rare. So we don't really see that many patients that require these kind of investigations. But yes, we can scope them. We can do a CT scan or MRI. We can, but again, it's not common. Nice. I really like the great answer to an equally great question because it shows that the, the audience is really, really uh, paying attention to everything that you are actually presenting about. So that's a really good sign. Okay, so uh, I believe we, are, we have come to the end of our segment. There are actually still many good questions that we are unfortunately unable to answer due to the lack of time. However, we will be collating these questions answering them with the help of both Dr. Eugene and Dr. Eileen and posting it on our website. All right, so I think that was a very, very comprehensive uh, and good overview of colorectal cancer here. So thank you everyone for such an engaging session. I myself have learned so much more from this uh, one hour, short one hour, but very insightful one hour. Thank you for attending everyone. It's already 9.02 p.m. And may everyone have a good night. Thank you so much, Bye. Dr. Eugene. Thank you so much, Dr. Eileen. Really, Bye. really enjoyed the presentation and I believe everyone did too. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.